Hey friends, how are y'all doing today? Well, this weekend we did something pretty cool. We not only went to the Homesteaders of the Southeast event, but I spoke at it as well. This was the very first time I have ever presented at any event and I recorded it for you so that you could watch it if you are not able to be there with us in person or if you were there in person but we're kind of hopping between different presentations and you wanted to get the full lecture that I gave, this is your chance. At the event, I covered what is off-grid, how we live off-grid, and how you can get started in this off-grid life using just simple changes that you can make to really teach you what you need to do to get started off-grid. I hope y'all are going to love this presentation. Again, it was my first ever presentation, so if I seem a little nervous, that was why. I've only ever presented in school before, not in this sort of platform, but I really enjoyed being able to share the knowledge that I have with others, and that was just amazing to me. So I'm so thankful to Homesteaders of the Southeast for giving me the opportunity to present. I hope I have many more opportunities in the future. And let me know what you think of the presentation. It is a fairly long, I had 30 minute window and I'm going to try to leave it as much as I can in its whole form because I want you to have the experience like you were there in person that day. So enjoy friends. follow me on YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook. I'm Megan. Nice to meet all of y'all. My family and I, my son Declan, husband Kenneth down there, we live off-grid in the PD region of South Carolina, Marlboro County to be specific. Um, we recently bought 16 acres in August. Before that, we lived off-grid in our RV, a travel trailer that we have. It's 40 feet long, traveling the United States. So we've been off-grid in National Forest, BLM land, just living literally off the grid traveling for two years. So that's where we got our feet wet, learning how to off-grid. We do have solar power. That's probably the number one question we get is solar power. Uh, so that's how we were able to live off-grid and travel throughout the different National Forest and BLM lands. And then I was just gonna talk to y'all today about what off-grid actually is. There's a lot of misconceptions about what off-grid means to different people. And then we're going to go over how we do off-grid and then how you could do off-grid if you wanted to. Who here is already off-grid besides them? Because I know they are. That's it? That's awesome. Who wants to go off-grid? Yes. Okay. We have some off-grid converts coming then. Okay. So first we're going to talk about what is off-grid. There are actually three main types of off-grid living that most people don't think about. So you can be off-grid as in off your utility bills. That's the main one people think about. You're off power, you're off like city water, city sewage. You don't have any utility bills. I explain that to people as in I could pick up my life and travel to Colorado and I don't have to disconnect anything from anybody. I don't have power that needs to be shut off. I don't have you know, natural gas that has to be shut off. I don't need to call a cable company or nothing like that. I can just pick up and move wherever I want, whenever I want. Okay, so that's your first off-grid. Second off-grid would be off of the medical grid, that's what they call it. So you don't have health insurance. You don't have standing doctor's appointments. You don't have yearly checkups, people like that. If you have a medical condition, you can't go medically off the grid. That's one thing. People, you don't have to do all three to be off-grid. There's different points and different ways you can do it. So for my family, we don't do medical insurance. We don't do yearly health exams. We don't have standing appointments, but we do go to the hospital if we need it. I am a nurse by profession, so I do believe in the medical system. I'm a pediatric nurse, but we just don't rely on it. So technically we are medically off the grid. The third off grid that people don't think about a lot is financially off the grid. That means you don't use banks, you don't take out loans, you don't have credit cards or anything like that. Nobody can financially trace your location. This is the off-grid most people think about when they think of like criminal minds when Garcia's like, he went off the grid. It's because they can't trace you met financially. If you're all three, you are amazing. But I don't know anybody who is off-grid off all three grids. Um, so we are not, we are only 
off the utility grid and off of the medical grid. We still use banks, we still do credit cards, we don't do loans, but we try to pay in cash if we can. So those are the three different off-grids. And then how we off-grid ourselves, we live in a travel trailer, it's 40 feet long, Forest River, it's got two bedrooms, Declan has his own room, so it's kind of fancy. We have a solar system, uh, so we have 550 watts of solar power, and then four six volt golf cart batteries as a golf cart goes by. Um, and that powers all of our basic needs. If we need anything extra, if I wanna use my Instant Pot, if we just need to run extra power for some reason, we'll turn on our generator. So we have a generator as backup. Uh, we do wanna expand our solar eventually in the future, but we are also cutting back on how much power we need. So we are still continuing to learn more things about how we can cook outside better and how we can use fire better instead of relying on our propane stove inside. And then for water, we do rainwater catchment. Uh, so we have a 200 gallon rainwater catchment system that is set up on our rabbit colony. And that does awesome. I don't know if y'all got rain where y'all were in South Carolina the past few days, but it stormed and our barrels are overflowing full of rainwater. So that is amazing. Another one we get is how do we use the bathroom? Everybody wants to know how you do that off grid. We have composting toilets. Uh, they're super simple. They don't have to be fancy. You can buy actual handbooks on how to do composting toilets. My favorite is the human manure handbook. A lot of third world countries do composting toilets as a normal natural thing. Our relief agencies, American Red Cross and everything, will build composting toilets and take it to their countries, but nobody really does it over here. We learned about composting toilets in the RV world. A lot of RVers who go off grid do composting toilets. And so to make it safe, we do let waste and everything compost for a year. It doesn't go in our vegetable garden. It's got its own little area so that it's all safe. It's not hard to deal with. It doesn't stink. So that is always a great way to go. And then for gray water, which is like your shower water, your sink water, wash water is what it's considered. We pour that onto our compost bin, our vegetable compost bin, and it will compost with that and it keeps the compost nice and moist. If anybody knows anything about compost, you're supposed to wet it down. We just use our gray water. So we try to double everything up. The main thing about off-grid is you want as much redundancy as you can get. Everything needs a backup to your backup. We do propane for our stove. We have, we have propane to cook. We also have many propane systems if we need it. We have firewood set up, we can cook outside. I have all the equipment to cook outside. So you just need backups to your backups to your backups. Everything you want to have multiples of. And so we, the main reason we chose off-grid, we were off-grid traveling and everything, but we were in Iowa two winters ago. And I don't know if y'all remember, but Texas froze, like froze solid. People were freezing to death in their homes because the power company shut their power off. My parents live in Texas. That was the scariest time for me and I decided I would never live like that. We were done. I would not rely on a power company to provide my power. I would not rely on a water company to have water for my family. My child's life is more important than that. So instead, we went the route of off-grid. We traveled. We come to South Carolina on a job. I was working at Charlotte, North Carolina in the children's hospital there. It's a great children's hospital. We stayed in South Carolina and we never left. So <laughs> that's how we landed here. We were actually staying in Blacksburg, not far from here, and we're just searching across the entire state to find our property. And we found 16 acres of raw land in the PD region, but it didn't have anything on it, except for trees and a swampy area. So from August to November 1st, we hand cut trees to be able to make a driveway to get our RV on. And if y'all have seen that YouTube video, we literally just had enough space for our RV and that was it. We didn't have anything else cleared. From November 1st until today, we have cleared the rest of our driveway. It's 250 feet. It is now gravel, so you can get up and down it with no issues. We have a separate spot for our RV that is not on the gravel driveway. We have a meat rabbit colony that doubles as our rainwater catchment and our food source. We have a 2,500 square foot garden that we rely on for food. We have meat chickens, layer chickens, and we have goats. And all in like six months by hand. We don't have tractors, we don't have anything. It just takes hard work. So how can you live off grid? Anybody who lives on grid wants to learn how to live off grid, start where you're at. The first thing we switched out 
with our coffee maker. I don't know about y'all, but I can't go without coffee. And coffee makers draw a ton of power. If you're gonna put one on a solar system, you're gonna eat up your power bank in no time. Ours, even our 550 watts, if we have nothing but our coffee maker on, it will shut off before our coffee pot is brewed. Just don't, it ain't worth it. So find a different alternative. Our alternative we currently do is we boil water and use a French press. Works great. Doesn't take any longer than a coffee pot. All it takes time is to boil water and then you let it soak in the French press for three minutes and it's done. So that's an easy fix. Another one is a microwave. We got rid of our microwave. If I need to heat something up, it needs to be on the stove or in the oven. We don't cook with a microwave. Popcorn can even be done on the stove or outside over a campfire. So that's another one that is a hydraulic power. Now fridge and freezers, people tend to think of as hydraulic powers and they're actually not. A freezer you can run on solar power with no issues. Especially a deep freezer. If it's full, it takes less power. So deep freezers you can have. We have two fridge and freezers on our small solar system. 550 watts is not nothing. I mean, some people out there have 12,000 watt systems for their houses. We don't even have a thousand and we can do it on two fridge and freezers. So don't worry about that. But other things you're thinking, vacuum cleaners use a lot of power. So learn to sweep your floors instead. I sweep carpet, it works great. If we wanna use a vacuum, we can use it on our solar, but if we're running a whole lot of other things, then we may have to recharge our batteries if it's not a sunny day. And that's where your generator comes in as a backup. So if it's a cloudy day, if it's winter time and it's snowing, which we get on the rare chance in South Carolina, especially where we're at, uh, then you may have to run your generator for a bit. But that's okay. That just lets you know, hey, I'm using too much power. I need to start looking at what I'm using and I need to cut back. But where you're at, if you're in a grid tied house, just start cutting back on your power. Start noticing what you're using and how much power it uses. So TVs, we have a TV, we have one TV, we have two computers, and then we run our lights. And that's about it for a daily basis besides our two fridge and freezers on our power. Um, if we need to run more than that, like I said, I do have an Instant Pot. It's great for summer cooking because we don't have AC. It can get hot, open some windows. We have some fans running right now. Luckily in the summer you get more power because there's more sun out. So you can run the extra fans that you won't be running in the winter. For winter, I highly suggest wood stoves. We do not have one yet. We are running all of our heat off propane and that is expensive. Propane you can use, you're not considered grid tied because it's a prepaid service. So that's with our phones. We don't have a phone company, we use prepaid phones. Straight Talk is our favorite, we've had them for years. Uh, you don't even technically have to give them your name or anything when you sign up. You can be completely anonymous. And it's a $45 plan. You can buy you a card at Walmart. If you ain't got the money one month, you're fine. For our internet, we use a hotspot. We have a phone. I upload YouTube videos. It's very slow. It takes an entire day to upload a video, but it works off the grid. Um, I know some people like to go for that satellite internet when they live off grid, but technically you're still grid tied then. It's just a different type of grid. Somebody just took the grid and moved it up into space. So with our hotspot, it's again, prepaid. I can pick up and move and there's nothing tied me down to that location. I can decide I don't wanna pay internet this month and no big deal, I just don't have internet for that month because it's all prepaid services. Um, so we don't do anything that ties us to an electric company. Our power company does not know our names, they don't know our address, they don't know where we're at. Um, we have had the county come out and it will vary by mileage depending on where you are in South Carolina but a lot of counties don't even require you to have permits in South Carolina to build because you're considered a cabin in the woods, a hunting cabin. You're not considered a house if you're not tied to the utility grid. The inspector told us their main thing is to make sure you are safe with your utilities. We don't have utilities, so there's not much he can do for us. Um, so check with your county enforcers. If you wanna build a cabin on raw land, you can do it most places in South Carolina without even needing a building inspection. So that is always nice. <laughs> you don't have to do it. We are working on building us a cabin. So if you're not following our YouTube, you can see the process and how we go through that. But we are going to build a 600 square foot house. We're staying small. We like our small. It's much easier to manage off grid. If you can do small, stay small. It takes less to heat, takes less to cool, and you can just do it easier. Who has a question? Anybody? What's your question? 
Does any of that matter? Uh, technically, no, since it's not inspected. We will be using it just for longevity of the house, but in South Carolina, and I've looked into it, even if you need your house inspected, if you have the inspector come out and verify you have woods on your property, you can use wood that is mid milled from your property. Um, even when you need a building inspection, you just have to have proof that the wood come from your property and then it was cut correctly. But technically, if you don't need a building inspection, none of that matters. Um, you just want to make sure your house is safe to live in. And so just follow whatever makes you feel safest about it. Anybody else? So I have a question. Yes. Are you officially going, um, so you're not doing the well? Oh, okay. So the one thing I didn't cover, if you have been following our YouTube channel, we attempted to put in a shallow well here in South Carolina. The theory holds our water table's high. You should be able to pump water from the ground in South Carolina. And we did it, but you pump a very slow amount. It is like ridiculous slow because you need pockets of water to hit to be able to get the well. And in South Carolina, all of our ground is sandy and the water just kind of flows throughout and there's not a big pocket of water. You kind of need clay for that. And we don't have a whole lot where we're at. We are more coastal, we're headed towards the beach and most of our land is nothing but sand. As for a deep well, deep well pumps pull a ton of power, a ton of power. If you want to do a deep well off grid, the best option you have is to put a holding tank on your property, run your generator to pump the water up into the holding tank, and then you can use a smaller pump to get it from the tank into the house. The smaller pump can run on solar. That deep well pump is gonna take a massive solar system to run because it pulls a lot of power. Currently, we are just on rainwater. We are really good at conserving our water that comes from living in an RV. Our inspectors told us it takes each person about 120 gallons a day per person when you live on the grid. We go through about 40 gallons for three people every three to four days. So we have drastically cut our water usage. It's not hard. Just cut the water off when you're in the shower, you know, just rinse off, cut it off. Wash, then cut it back on, rinse off, cut it off. Like we just really are really careful about how much water we use when we're washing dishes, washing ourselves. Uh, I drink a ton of water. I probably drink about a gallon of water a day. So that's where most of that water usage goes. So you can do it. You just have to watch your water usage. And because we have composting toilets, our toilets don't use water. So that's one expense we don't have to worry about. And toilets use a ton yes. of water. Toilets use a lot of water. A lot of water. People don't think it, but it's like almost a gallon of water every time you flush your toilet. So you're using a ton of water and we don't we don't have to worry about that. So that is much easier for us. What other questions you might got? I mean, uh, and just wondering at least to start with like solar backup. Uh-huh. You know, kind of a redundancy to being on the grid, but yeah. if it fails to then to move eventually off. Um, where do you start? I mean Whew. Yeah. That one is that one is really hard to because we had to do a whole lot of researching. Kenneth actually built our solar system. So any questions would probably, he might be able to answer better when we break out into small groups. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it, but we did a whole lot of internet researching to get to where we're at. Um, but it, it's hard. It is really hard to try to figure out. Anybody wants to, we use Renogy, that's our main like solar panels and stuff, and they have been a great brand. We've had them for two years. We traveled across the country, taking them up mountains, in the deserts. I mean, they've been whacked with trees and everything else, and they have held up fantastic. So I do recommend the Rana G solar panels, and they're not expensive. Um, we just have 550 watts, five 100 watts, and one 50 watt panel. Do you have a question? That's a question more response. Okay, good, because I... am an, an expert at all, but I have to do two solar power, and you know, back up regular power. Yeah. And basically, it's not the thing. If you have regular power... Your solar won't run. You're selling solar back to the company, yeah. And so if you lose power because the company's lost power, you lose power. And that's another thing. Yeah, if you have a grid-tied solar system, you're still grid-tied. You're not off the grid. It sounds nice in theory. If you have the power company installed, oh. then you like that. If you install the power yourself, then you can put a switch box out there power goes off. Gotcha. So basically your solar would just run to keep your batteries charged unless you lose power. 
and then you can go switch it over to solar. They don't like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they don't. Um, they wouldn't like for you just to turn off your power and go straight to solar either, but uh, it happens. I know people who live in the city who are off grid because they do that. They just cut their, turn their power off and put solar panels up because some locations require you to be grid tied. I don't know of any in South Carolina, thank goodness, but some in the United States require you to be hooked up to a power company. South Carolina, all you need is a septic permit. You don't have to put in the septic. You just got to have the permit to do anything with raw land. We have found that out the hard way. Once you get the permit, you're good for five years. You can do whatever you want on your property as long as you keep that permit for five years. After five years, if you need anything else, you have to renew your permit or get a septic. Which is septic is a great option for off-grid. It don't require any power, um, but we just don't need one. If we use a septic, it would be just for gray water. That would be our only septic system used because the composting toilets don't use septic. And once you go to a composting toilet, most people don't go back to a flushing toilet. So there's just no point. We had a gray water system. We dug a trench. Yeah. Like feeds out into like my herb bed. Oh, nice. So, so it's, it's like its own little yeah. leach field. So it, it doesn't yep. bother the herbs at all. Yeah. And it's great fertilizer for them. As long as you use earth friendly soaps and products, it's great for your garden. Just look into what you're using. I know a lot of people are big fans of Dr. Bronner's Castile Soap. Um, heads up, as a soap maker, it's not actually Castile Soap, so read your ingredients. Uh, Castile is pure olive oil soap, and Dr. Bronner's just uses the name. I'm not saying it's not earth friendly, it's just not what people think they're getting. So just know what ingredients are in your products and what is safe for the earth. I do a lot of research for I buy something like dish soap or anything, and I make a lot of our own. Um, with natural ingredients so that I know personally it's safe and it's not going to hurt my plants when I pour it on my compost bin or something. Because I got tomatoes growing out there in my compost right now, so I don't want to yeah. damage them with Me. body soap. <laughs> it's free tomatoes, right? <laughs> Alright, any other questions? So who's going to go off grid now? Everybody wants to? Everybody should. I mean, you should. If you... If you don't ever want to be in a natural disaster and not have the resources you need. So ours is a preparedness thing. We're always prepared. We had this past winter, a tree fell on the side of our RV. All of our neighbors lost power. They couldn't do anything. We were able to go out, take care of that tree, take care of our anal animals in the last storm and not have to worry about it. We could go back in and our RV's warm because we didn't rely on the power company. So we were prepared already. And that's the whole point is just to be prepared. If you can only go a little off grid, go a little off grid. You know, any little thing you do, it's just gonna make the earth better, it's just gonna make you better, it's gonna make you more prepared. Just make sure you always have backups to your backups. So everything you have in place, everything you rely on, have a backup to it. If you've got solar, have a generator. And then after that, have extra batteries. That always works. Uh, we run an electric goat fence off our solar and it works great. Um, so have that. <laughs> And we have extra batteries if we need to swap it out if our solar needs a chance to recharge. For water, we have rainwater, but we can also have water filters. We can we have jugs to go out and haul in water if we need it. If our rainwater is not enough, if we're in a drought, we can do that. We have the equipment to purify our water if we need to do that. Uh, for food, we have propane. We have wood. We can cook outside. We can cook inside. I have a little camp stove that I pressure can on. So I even pressure can in my little bitty RV. So you can do it too. Just have a little camp stuff set up outside with a little wind breaks, works great. I pressure canned pork last night, so it works. Uh, you have shows on that one? I have not done a show on it yet, but I can. I would like to see that yeah. because I don't can because I don't have enough room in my kitchen. Yep. I see it, and if you're doing it like that, yep. I, I do it all outside. I do it on a camp stove. Yep. I don't want it in the kitchen. It's yeah, it's, well, that and I, Pressure canning scares me. I know my pressure canner has safety valves and everything, and it's not going to blow up. But I can do it outside, and I feel much safer about it. Um, so I set it up, and I just do little chores around it, and I can keep an eye on it and keep an ear out for it. And it's outside. It's away from my son. He can go play. I can watch him play, and I'm all good. Uh, we are hopefully in the future going to build an outdoor kitchen that is a completely off grid and it's going to be awesome. I'm so excited for it because I need a bigger kitchen space and who doesn't need an outdoor kitchen when they butcher their own animals? Like nobody wants to bring that whole mess up inside, especially when your counter space is like this big, which is what mine is. <laughs> so 
we definitely are, we'll, we'll do a, a little show on how to pressure can off the grid as well. I do need to do that, okay. Anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Cut for your water cash. Uh-huh. Um, are you using barrels? Ice yes. Containers? We do have a YouTube video on that. Okay. We use recycled pickle barrels. There is a few places in South Carolina that resells them from companies. They have factory labeling on them that say that they are pickle barrels. That way you know. Whatever you get, make sure it has labelings on it. You know what it is and you know it's safe. And they're black, so no sunlight gets in. So you don't have to worry about algae. With the IBC totes, people are spray painting them. They're covering them because water and sunlight makes algae. And you do not want your water green. Yeah, we started with IBC. Yeah. And then we moved to uh, <laughs> bought one at Home Depot, 550 gallons, and it's black. Yes. And we are, we are buying a bigger system as well to set up. My main thing with rainwater, every roof line you have needs to have water safe roofing and needs to have rainwater catchment system. All it takes is a, ours is gutter systems on the side of our rainwater, our rabbit colony, and they just drain into barrels and the barrels are linked together. I don't have to do anything to it. Each barrel has its own little water spigot. I can hook a water hose up to it. I can dump, five, dump it into five gallon buckets, whatever I need. And that is awesome. Everything that drips water, that catches water at our house, has a bucket or a barrel under it to catch every bit of water we can. That goes to water our animals, that goes to water us. We don't water our garden. So, <laughs> I don't know how many people water their garden, but we don't waste our water on our garden. We wood chip it. So we do bag to eat and we do thick wood chips out there in our garden. And even when we go weeks without water, our garden looks beautiful because it holds all the moisture in there so you don't have to do it. So we use the earth as best as we can. Instead of watering my seeds in or plants in, I try to plant before rainstorms and let the earth water them in for me. So I'm not wasting my water to plant my garden. So you just gotta work with nature. Do as much as you can. In the heat of the day, work with nature and get outside. Do not stay inside your house, it gets way hot. Even with fans going, it gets way hot. And if you can do shade cloths up to block some of that sun, it's gonna cut your heat drastically. We do that for our rabbits who are not heat tolerant, and we do that for us. We have shade cloths that go off our awning of our RV. We'll cut the heat down big time. And then fans, you want air circulating. So open windows and fans, you just need to work with the nature and get everything going. Did you have a question? No, okay. If you did, you done forgot it. <laughs> what was that? Okay, so you don't want asphalt. Asphalt will leach into your water. And a main thing with shingles is the rocks and the asphalt from the shingles will leach into your water. So metal. metal roofing is good. And actually, um, Lowe's makes, the roofing on our rabbit colony is a composite material that Lowe's makes. The asphalt is on the outs or the inside and it's got natural uh, fibers on the outside and it is rainwater catchment safe. And it's right at Lowe's. You can get metal sheeting at Lowe's too, but that's what we went through with our rabbit colony because we like the color and we like the look of it and it was easy to cut. You can cut it with just a pair of scissors or something, you know. But anything with asphalt on the outside or any kind of debris, anything like that, you don't want. I wouldn't do anything that could break off and get into my water. Um, but another thing with rainwater catchment, a lot of people talk about, and if you're looking it up, you'll look into a first flush diverter is what it's called. We don't use one of those. Our rainwater system has these black plastic things from Lowe's that catch leaves. They're leaf catchers. And that's the main thing you need to keep your big debris out. Over all of your openings, you want mosquito netting to keep the frogs out. Because before we, before that, when I opened a barrel one day, there was a frog sitting on the inside and about gave me a heart attack. So <laughs> cover your things with netting. You don't want mosquitoes in there. You don't want frogs in there, especially if you're going to drink it. And then always filter it afterwards as well. But the first flush diverter everybody talks about is to keep bacteria and stuff from like bird poop. If they poop on your roofs from getting into your water, Science has proven it's not needed. Because the sun beats on your roof, the UV rays sterilize anything that's on your roof. They do a much better job than that first flush diverter and the first flush diverter is just gonna hold bacteria in it where water sits in it. Um, so we don't have any of that. And it just literally, all you need is something to catch the leaves and the debris and mosquito nettings over all of your openings to keep mosquitoes and frogs out of your water because they will get in there. Any other questions?
No. How much more time I got? Oh, I did it. Y'all, this was my first speaking time. Y'all were awesome. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I feel like a real YouTuber now. Um, if you don't follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, you really should. I've met some awesome people off there. Some awesome people who are here today that I've met off there. And I love meeting all of y'all. And I'm glad y'all were here. Okay, friends. So, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Maybe you even learned a thing or two that you didn't know. If you did, let me know down in the comments below. If there was something I didn't cover that you want to know about, ask your questions in the comments below. That way I know for future presentations what else to throw in there. And now, I just want to take a moment with y'all to remind y'all today is Memorial Day. Today is a day very near and dear to my heart as... I have many people in my family who have served in the military and we take that as a very grave responsibility. Today is the day that we thank all of the soldiers who served for our country but did not come home alive. This day is for them, not for us, not for the living, but to remember them. So today, maybe at the end of this video, just take a few seconds think of all of those souls that were lost and say thank you. They paid the sacrifice for you. So thank them for that sacrifice. Until next time, my friends. See you later. Bye now.